Let's talk about Plato. And why not? People have been talking about Plato for over 2,000 years. Now, there are many, many aspects of Plato. In this short little video, I'm going to just simply talk about his theory of knowledge. What do we know? What can we know? Is an age-old question in philosophy that still concerns philosophers today. Plato was probably the first philosopher to really delve into the issue of knowledge. What it is, how we can know it. How Plato deals with the question and problem of knowledge and how we can actually know anything is really best discussed and described in his example of the concept of justice. Justice is obviously an ethical issue, and it's also a political issue. And for Plato, it's also a question of how do we understand and know what justice is. The problem with the concept of justice is it's rather abstract and indefinite. It's not a concrete thing like, oh, look, there's a tree. We know exactly what a tree is. We can see it. We can feel it. We can say that is a discrete entity. Justice is not like that. Justice is not something we can point to. Justice is not something you can hold in your hands. You cannot perceive it by any of your five senses. And there is no instrument by which we can measure it. There isn't a justometer that we can just hold up to anything and say, ah, yes, justice is here or it's not. And yet, do we not have a sense of justice? Not only a, a vague sense, an indefinite sense of what justice is, but a strong sense of this is where justice is happening or this is where justice is not happening. C consider this example. You're in a university course, and for this course, you work very long and very diligently on a paper. You put in a great deal of effort, and you hand in your paper to your professor after hours and hours of work. But without even looking at your paper, the professor just tosses it in the trash and tells you you have failed. Would you not consider that unjust? Well, of course you would, but, but why? This is part of Plato's question here. Why do you consider anything just or unjust? With your professor, you would say that this professor has not treated you fairly, right? But what do you mean by fairness? Why should you be treated fairly? Whatever fairly means. What does fairness have to do with justice? What is justice? How would justice play out in this situation? You could perhaps say, well, the professor was not doing the job a professor should do, like read your paper, care about what you wrote in your paper. Okay, but why should a professor do that? Why should doing one's job be considered justice? But what are you really thinking about? What are you really knowing? And as Plato asks, what are we defining as justice? And the point of all of this is that it's so much easier for us to feel and think on a certain level that something is just or unjust than it is to intellectually define define what justice is. And Plato, being a philosopher, he doesn't want just a feeling or just examples. He wants a definition. And not just a definition, but a definition that you can explain and defend. And frustrating our attempts to define justice, and this is very much a part of Plato's point, is that we have never experienced an example of perfect justice. Now, this perhaps is more of an ancient Greek idea than something we would think today. But in the ancient Greek mindset, something that is perfect is superior to things that aren't. Now, obviously, of course, that's the meaning of words, right? If we claim we know what perfect means and all of that. But it was much bigger of a deal. I think now we've gotten used to nothing is perfect and It'll never be perfect. You know, I'll never write the perfect paper. I will never have the perfect professor. This will never be the perfect video. And so we just kind of deal with that. Well, Plato didn't want to deal with that, and a lot of other people in his time didn't either. No, perfection is what we're going for. And so we don't just want justice. We want perfect justice. And so this desire for perfection, this desire for things that are unchanging and perfect, very much colors how Plato approaches this question of what is justice, because what he's saying is that we never have experienced perfect justice, 
the epitome of justice. Therefore, we cannot really have a good definition of what justice is, because you cannot really understand what something is unless you see the perfect example of that thing. At least that's the theory. So this idea of Plato's of of looking for perfection, and specifically in this case, perfect justice, is important because if you have a real sense of what perfect justice is, then that's a standard by which you can measure justice. You could say that your professor was unjust in trashing your paper if you can say, well, this is the perfect definition of justice. It's an absolute perfect definition of what justice is, and therefore I can say this does not measure up to that. It's the idea of comparison to a standard, and we would have no ability to make judgments if we have no real standard by which to measure something or compare something to that standard. It would be as if the standard of measure that is a meter or a foot, if you're old-fashioned, if that was changeable, if it was a different length every time we encounter it, then it's not really usable as a standard. If your meter is different than Joe's meter, from Jill's meter, from the meter in the other county or the other country, then it's just a matter of whim. It has no value. It's it's just way too relative. And Plato was very anti-relativity in terms of knowledge. No, knowledge is either absolute or it's not knowledge at all. He makes a very strong distinction between knowledge and opinion. Opinions are subjective perceptions. Individuals have opinions. And that's not knowledge. Knowledge is that the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. Opinion is, that's too hot for me, or that's too cold. Plato isn't interested in that. He's interested in an exact definition, an exact perfect definition. That's not subjective to people's personal opinions or personal perspectives. So Plato's reasoning is, in order to have perfect knowledge, because of course we don't just want a little bit of knowledge, we want perfect whole knowledge. To have perfect knowledge means to have a full, perfect understanding of what is perfect justice, a perfect meter, even a perfect tree. I'll get into that later. True knowledge must be perceived by reason as an objective understanding of perfect truth about a topic. What is true must be true independent of all individual perceptions or particular circumstances. For something to be objectively true, it must be true for everyone, and any other source of knowledge is not really knowledge at all. So Plato is asking, how do we get past personal perspective, personal opinions to get to actual knowledge? Plato does observe that objects in the world do fit into discernible patterns. We can identify qualities that objects in the world have. And I'm going to switch to objects here because it's just easier to explain things than than concepts like justice or fairness. Plato is a particular entity. There is Plato. Plato and Socrates, for example, are particular people, humans. And we can call them both human, but the term human stands for a universal concept that refers to all particular entities that share the set of properties that compose the definition of human. So if we look at a group of people, we can see, understand, that there are different people here, but they all share something in common. They're all people. They're all humans. Same when we look at trees. We see a group of trees. We understand that they are particular trees, and they differ in some particular traits, but we recognize that they are all trees. And that's part of what Plato is getting at. What is knowledge? Well, we recognize that that's a tree and that's a tree. But how? How do we recognize? How do we identify particular objects as the type of objects that they are? This goes back to the question, how do we know what justice is? How do we recognize that a situation is just or unjust? Same with how to recognize that that is Plato. How do I recognize that Plato is a human? How do I recognize that that's a tree, an example of a particular tree? To understand what Plato does with this, I'm going to use uh, this example. He doesn't really use this example, but I think it's a really good one. Look, Look at this object here. What is this object? Now, if you reply and say, oh, that's a circle, 
Your answer is very understandable, but it's not exactly accurate. So what is the definition of a circle? Well, a good definition is that a circle is a closed curved shape made of points equidistant from a fixed point within the curve. That's a reasonable geometric definition of the geometric shape of a circle. So what Plato would ask, and what you should ask, is does this circle here on this screen fit the definition of what a circle is? And the answer is not exactly. If we truly measured the points of this shape here with great precision, we will find that this circle is not a perfect circle. It is not a closed curve shape made of points equidistant from a fixed point. That is because every point on the screen here is not exactly perfectly equidistant from a center point. There's a bunch of dots here, but they're not perfect dots. It's not a perfect circle. The point of this is, is that the object on your screen here is not exactly a circle. It is an attempt to portray a circle. And what Plato is saying is that all objects in the visible world are like this. All objects in the world are imperfect copies of something that is perfect. Plato's claim is that we can identify this as a circle because we have some sort of knowledge of the perfect circle. And we use that knowledge of the perfect circle as the measure of what a circle is. That's the thing about a meter. I know what a meter is because I have this example of this is the measure, this is the standard of what a meter is, and therefore I can say this is a meter long. However, we have never experienced a perfect circle, just as we have never experienced perfect justice. The circle on your screen here is not actually a circle. It is merely an object that is circular. It is an object that has qualities that cause it to resemble a circle. To us today, this line of reasoning may sound a little odd, but of course this was over 2,000 years ago, and people did think differently. Always remember in philosophy that what you think you know is a product of many, many centuries of history, many, many generations of human beings who have thought things before. And so you have the benefit of many generations of people that Plato did not have. But Plato's line of reasoning, though it's a little different than ours, actually makes some sense because what he's asking here is really, again, what is knowledge and how do we know things? So that question becomes, how do we come to the judgment that something is a circle if we have never seen a perfect circle? How did we learn what circle means? Plato's theory is that we can recognize a particular object as a circle because the object partakes of the form of circularity and that we have knowledge of the form of circularity. And by form here, that's form with a capital F, Plato means the perfect reality of this quality, the perfect circle. When we have a sense experience of a particular object, what we're doing is we are, in Plato's mind, intellectually comparing that sense experience to our knowledge of the form of circularity and understand that that object is circular. When we look at an object and think, that is a tree, how do we come to this conclusion? Plato's answer is that, yes, part of that information is provided by our physical senses. We are seeing the tree. We think it is a tree because it looks like what we think a tree looks like. But to think it is a tree because it looks like a tree doesn't answer the question of why we think it looks like a tree. What is a tree anyway? How do we know that something is a tree? This is where the idea of form comes in. There is a form of treeness, just like there is a form of circularity. And indeed, all of our knowledge is ultimately tied to, connected to, our knowledge of the forms. So Plato's theory of knowledge is connected to his theory of reality, of how things actually are. And that is that the particular objects in the world, which we can experience with our senses, are related to universal objective truths. Remember, we're looking for the perfect standard of things, 
by which to measure our knowledge of particular things. Any particular tree we know is a tree because we're comparing it to our knowledge of the perfect tree. Any particular tree is a tree in Plato's theory that it participates in the form treeness. In other words, that particular object is a copy of the perfect tree, or an example of the perfect tree, just like our circle wasn't really a perfect circle, but it is partaking of the form of the perfect circle. That object resembled a circle because it partakes of the form of circularity. This tree is a tree in that it resembles the perfect tree, it partakes of the form, so reality is such that there are perfect universal forms and particular objects that are not perfect, but they resemble and partake somehow of the form of the universal. Each object in the world is a particular instance of a universal form. How all that works, Plato never explains, but that's how he thinks reality is. And he thinks reality is this way because he is asking and answering the questions about what is knowledge in the way that he is. If you give Plato his due, this line of reasoning does make a certain amount of sense. We live in a world of visible objects, and in that world we find that particular objects do have a set of constant universal qualities. These trees share qualities. They are all different, but they all share the same qualities. That's why we can identify and talk about objects in our world. They're all particular individual distinct objects but we can refer to them all with universal terms like tree, because despite their individual differences, these objects share certain qualities. And we use names for these sets of shared qualities like tree, human, circle, and justice. Plato's claim is that these names correspond to universal entities, the forms. The forms consist of the essential qualities common to all objects within that kind of object denoted by the name. So tree, particular trees, universal concept of tree, universal reality of treeness. So within Plato's theory of forms, every quality that we can think of, circularity, tallness, greenness, etc., we can recognize because we know the perfect objective universal form of that quality. And it's the same with objects in general. I know that that's a tree, that that's a beaver, that that's a human, that that's a circle, because I know the perfect objective universal form of that object. You know what an object is because it partakes of the form of that object, and you know the form, so you recognize it comparing it to the form. So then back to the original question of what is justice, which was a very important question for Plato. He wrote a lot about the topic of justice. What is justice? We can know what justice is, not by looking at things in the world, not by knowing what perfect justice is in the world, because we've never seen perfect justice in the world, but we have some kind of knowledge of what perfect justice is, the form of justice, and various human actions partake to varying degrees of the form of justice. And so we can make judgments about mean professors who don't actually read papers because we know what perfect justice is. Even if we can't really explain it, even if it's not really a conscious knowledge, somewhere within our psyche we can know that this is not just because we know what justice is because we know the form of justice. So again, this is Plato's view of knowledge, and this is Plato's view of reality. Reality is composed of particular objects in universal forms. Particular objects get their qualities from the forms. We have some kind of knowledge of the universal forms, therefore we can recognize particular objects. Simple. All objects that are beautiful have the universal form of beauty in common. All actions of justice have the form of justice in common. All trees have treeness in common, circles, pigeons, beavers, humans, anything, everything. That's how it works in Plato's theory. Certainly you're thinking there, this is not how we think about things today. No, it's not. But it's not so daft. It really isn't. Think about the idea of beauty. We can say, oh, look at this rose. This rose is beautiful. This rose 
grew from a bud, it flowered into beauty, but then after I took this photo, it eventually withered and died. The rose lost its beauty, but does beauty itself seek to exist if every object in the world ceased to be? Would beauty cease to exist? Plato says no. The universal beauty is not in objects. It never changes. It's this perfect form that is beauty, unaffected by the world of particular objects. And particular objects in the world, they come into existence, they go out of existence, but the forms exist in and of themselves. They're universal, they're unchanging, they're perfect. Plato refers to and wants to know about beauty itself, justice itself, treeness itself, the forms. That's what matters. When we have knowledge of justice itself, we do not just have somebody's opinion about what justice is. We know what perfect, true justice is. If you find Plato's theory of forms a little confusing, here's an example that should help clarify. Consider the multiplication table. Does it exist? Obviously it must. It would be silly to say that 5 times 5 equals 25 is not true, that it's not real. But where does the multiplication table exist? Yes, you can write it down. Here's an example. But what's in this table are just a bunch of symbols that represent the reality of multiplication. You have not created the truth that 5 times 5 equals 25 by writing it down. Erasing or destroying the symbols that you wrote does not destroy the truth and reality of the multiplication table. The reality of the mathematics is not changed by what you or anyone else says or does in regard to them. Even if every human being completely forgot about multiplication, the multiplication table would still exist and its content would still be true. And no human being invented multiplication. We learned about it. So multiplication, trees, circles, justice exist independently of human minds that think about these concepts. So, okay, if the forms exist outside of this realm, how do we learn about them? Well, Plato gives a kind of wishy-washy answer on this. He just simply says, we remember them. We recollect them. The Greek word for recollection is anamnesis. We understand the point that Plato is accessing here because sometimes we're not told something directly, but we figure things out as we go. And that's what Plato really means here, is that we have this latent knowledge buried inside us somewhere. From birth, before birth, uh, Plato believes that we had souls that existed before our physical incarnation here. And in that incarnation before this one, we knew the forms. He doesn't really explain how it is that we ended up here, but in ending up here, we kind of forgot what we knew, and we have to recollect our knowledge of the forms through living life and through education. And we need to uncover this knowledge that is buried within our psyche to understand things more perfectly. Now, obviously, we don't agree with this conception of reality and knowledge today, but that doesn't mean that people for many centuries did not think that this was a good way of looking at the world. And again, if you give him credit that is due, this isn't a completely daft idea. It does make a certain amount of sense on a certain level. And so, yes, for centuries, people thought this is what reality is, and this is what knowledge is. Plato said that the way we come to increase our knowledge is to use reason to think about concepts. And in this use of reason, which is inward looking into the depths of our own mind and understanding of things, we use logic to uncover how things work. So we don't need to bother much with the study of objects in the visible world. We look inward. We think about what would justice be? What would trees be? That's accessing the true knowledge of the forms by using reason, 
which is independent of self sense experience, which is independent of opinion, we are getting to real knowledge. Therefore, to learn about the world and learn about concepts within the Platonic philosophy of how the world is and how knowledge is, the way that we know about reality, learn about reality, is not through going into the world and looking at particular trees, particular people, particular instances of justice or injustice. We learn about these things by contemplating the forms, by using our mental capacities to recollect the forms, to understand through reason alone how things are. In that sense, Plato is still with us. This idea that we can, through reason alone, through the application of our thinking alone, we can come to understand what is true and what knowledge is.